All right, so I started hinting with the children that there's a lot going on. So last week, Pastor Kristen was here, and she, I watched her sermon, so I know that she went boiler up. Um, I don't know what the Hoosier people do, because uh, I just don't know. Um, but, greetings back. <laughs> anyway, she was here last week, and she talked about the vineyard workers, and the first shall be last, and God's amazing grace that goes beyond all bounds. Well, if you were listening just a few minutes ago, today's gospel lesson, we heard another parable about another vineyard. Who'd have thunk? So, a lot, though, has happened in Jesus' life and ministry in between these two stories that really helps us understand today's text a bit better. Since we heard that phrase, the last shall be first and the first shall be last, Jesus and his disciples have traveled and made their way up to Jerusalem. Jesus gave a special speech to his disciples along the way. He spoke with the mother of some of his disciples and gave her a little lecture. He healed more people along the way, those that cried out to him. He entered the city on a donkey and a colt, though we don't know quite how that works out. Um, but we hear that story on Palm Sunday every year. He entered the temple in Jerusalem. He overthrew the tables of the money changers. He cursed a fig tree. And then he started teaching in the temple. That's a lot of stuff to go on in like one week. Granted, the timeline in reality is probably a little bit more spread out. Maybe day, days and time when they're written down get a little meshed together. But in our common lectionary, they come right after this text. So, therefore, when we pick up today, it's no surprise that Jesus has gained the attention of the religious leaders in the temple again. Those religious leaders, they know the scriptures well. Remember, this is from the Hebrew Bible. They learn it from the time that they're little, and it is on their hearts and their minds, and they know it. But they're also witnessing these amazing things that Jesus is doing. Jesus is healing a lot of people at a rapid rate. Jesus is causing a ruckus among the people because they're not quite sure exactly what to think. Jesus is teaching, but the teachings are different than what they're used to. It's the same scriptures, but the interpretations are not the way it's always been done. And so Jesus has brought a sense of chaos to their status quo. It's a challenge to their power and their way of life. It's a way that says, it might have always been done this way, but it's not necessarily going to be done this way anymore. And so these religious leaders, they want to know who he thinks he is and by whose authority he's doing these things. Maybe to trap him, maybe to challenge him, maybe to get him to stop, or maybe just to understand better because they're not quite getting it right now. Of course, as I said, Jesus is less likely to answer the questions than to ask the questions. So, when Jesus asks them a question in response to their question, they choose not to answer. So, when they choose not to answer, Jesus is like, mm, I'm not going to answer your question either. For while Jesus knows right from the start whose authority, that it's God's authority that grants him the ability to heal, to teach, and to preach, it's not quite yet time for him to reveal that out loud to those religious authorities. You see, doing so would probably really usher in the cross a lot faster, and he still has some work to do. It's just not time yet. Instead, Jesus uses this opportunity of telling, telling a series of parables that will force those religious leaders to answer and, in a way, admit to their own failings. I don't know about you, but sometimes these stories help us to see a little bit more clearly things that we're hiding from ourselves. 
And so if the religious leaders really didn't know what was going on or wanted to deny the truth of what was going on or not happening, these stories are like a mirror. They're letting them see it from a different perspective and letting them see that maybe things aren't exactly as God has called them to be. So today's parable then is the two sons in these parables. With all these vineyard stories we hear in the gospel, we have come to the conclusion pretty solidly that the vineyard owner is God. Problems tend to arise in these vineyard stories when we start to think that anybody else but God is the vineyard owner. So the other characters are the ones that we sometimes identify with, and sometimes that identification changes depending on our mood, our day, our actions, and our thoughts. But generally, historically speaking, in this particular context, the scholars tend to interpret the two sons as the religious leaders being the one son, and the tax collectors, the prostitutes, and the sinners being the other one. The religious leaders are seen as the son who readily agrees to go out and agrees to the father's request. Yes, dad, we'll go out and we'll serve in the, we'll serve in the vineyard and we'll do exactly what you want. But then gets distracted or whatever and fails to follow through. While the tax collectors, the sinners, and the prostitutes have turned the father down. No, dad, I'm not going to do it. It's too hard. It's hot outside. The sun is shining. I have other things to do. Whatever excuses come up with. But then they go and they repent. They have a change of heart. That's repent is turn around, change heart. And they follow through with the father's will after all. You know, neither son is really lifted up as an exemplary example both sons described here are far from the ideal son. The ideal son would be that third son who's not mentioned in the text. The son who hears the father's request, says, yes, father, I will go, and then follows through without hesitation. When we look at this, we know that the only real ideal son is Jesus, so... It's okay. We have a lot to live up to, but it's okay because we're not called to be that ideal one necessarily. The message that Jesus is sending here is really important though. The will of God, the Father, is one that cares for the poor and the marginalized. It's one that heals the sick, restores the outcast to community, and shares in God's abundant grace and mercy. Saying yes to helping those who are the least in the society, the ones who Jesus spent so much of his time ministering to, and then turning one's back on them, those same individuals ignoring them, supporting policies that harm them, or by marginalizing them further, is the exact opposite of God's will and what God is calling God's children to do. So this is where Jesus holds the religious leaders to answer. These are the people who God has called throughout the ages to teach and preach and care and heal and minister to and love unconditionally all of God's children. But Jesus asks them, which one did the will of the Father? They acknowledge that it is the son who went and followed through, who did, who better followed the will of the father. That even though it was not the right way, the son did the work that needed to be done. Think about it. Those religious leaders are getting convicted in that phrase. They're answering themselves. They know the truth. They know that this is what we're called to do, and we're not doing it yet. But Jesus doesn't end there, though. Jesus responds to them that the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the sinners will enter the kingdom of heaven before the religious leaders. 
Because those tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes, they heard John's message. They heard and repented and believed. The religious leaders are the ones who did not believe. They were given everything, and yet they could not see what was right in front of them. All hope is not lost, though. Jesus doesn't ban the religious leaders from the kingdom of heaven here. He doesn't say, you're not getting in. It's an exclusive club only for these people. Rather, he's telling them that it's another version of the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Humble yourselves because you're not better than all of these people who are outcasts of society. Just because you're in the church pew on a Sunday morning doesn't mean that your life is any more worthy than the person on the street corner. God loves you all, and you are all God's beloved children. And you are called because you know the truth, and the truth can set you free. And you know God's love, and you are called to share that love. And it hurts God when we don't share that love. That even though the religious leaders know the scriptures and what God asks of them, there are some of them that may not know as well, but believe and follow anyway. So for us, there is so much that we can take away from these parables, even though our lives and our circumstances are a bit different. For example, we can take away that God calls us to do more than make empty promises. We say prayers and repeat creeds and make promises and go through the lectionary and the liturgy every week. And we say it and then we promise to do it. And God calls us more than just to make the promises, but God calls us to follow through. That while ideally we would say yes and follow through, committing things and not doing things can cause more damage than being reluctant and then follow through. So if you're not sure, it's okay to be questioning. It's okay to have doubts and fears and concerns. It's safer to voice questions and to walk and work through those than it is to voice confidence and then crush somebody else. We can also take away that in some cases, in at, at least some cases, God's will can be discerned. We always talk about how do we know it's God's will. But we can discern at least some of God's will through the lens of the Gospels. The knowing that we are tasked with caring for the marginalized in our communities, the outcasts, the lonely, the imprisoned, those in need. Once we have discerned what God hopes the outcome to be, then we can start working through praying through the processes to get there. In fact, like I said, each week we pray, God's will be done. Not my will, not your will, God's will. God's will might not always look like our will. God's will, which disrupts the status quo, God's will might just be that that calls us to something greater than we could ever imagine or to be humbler than we would ever prefer. God's will puts the needs of the most vulnerable above the wants of the comfortable. Another takeaway for this text for our lives is that God is the God of second chances and third and fourth and fifth. These sinners and tax collectors believed John's message and repented and went and did the will of God. Even though we make mistakes, we fall short of following through with the promises we make. And in some cases, we're like that son who flat out refuses to do something what God would have us do. God gives us chance after chance to repent, to turn away from those behaviors that are not life-giving, and to turn back towards God to try again. This whole life that we're walking through is about trying and trying again. And we don't even have to do it alone. We are given the Holy Spirit to guide us. 
this communion of saints here to walk with us, and the words of Jesus in the scriptures to teach us. We are fed and forgiven over and over, loved and granted mercy and forgiveness more than we would ever deserve. And then we are called loudly and boldly by that still small voice, love one another just as I have loved you. So dear siblings in Christ, as we rejoice and get to celebrate Zoe's baptism today, let us also remember our own baptisms and the promises that were made for us, the promises that we affirmed when we were confirmed, and also that in our identity as the beloved children of God, we can give thanks to God for all the saints who have gone before us, for all those who have gone before answering that call to love one another, to share God's love with the world throughout the generations, so that we too may know the promises and share them through the generations to come.